We return this morning to our study of the book of Ephesians, and we're in chapter 1, verse 15. Now, if you kind of remember where we were at, um, we kind of took a break um, on Easter Sunday. We kind of took a survey approach to uh, chapter 1, verse 15, all the way through the middle part of chapter 2. Now we're going to go back to chapter 1 and look at that last section of chapter 1, Paul's apostolic prayer a little more closely. So if you remember in, so far in chapter one, we've covered his greeting in verses one and two, and then the reasons to praise God that he gave in verses three through 14. And so now we come to that final section in chapter one, which is Paul's prayer for the church in verses 15 through 23. So Ephesians chapter one, beginning in verse 15. For this reason, I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus which exists among you and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Now, a couple weeks ago on Easter Sunday, we covered a few aspects of this passage. And in our introduction, and several times, we've touched aspects of this passage. So the reason I want to go back is to pick up and look a little bit more at the big picture of this section, looking at Paul's apostolic example of prayer. And prayer is our topic for this morning. And I have to, first off, kind of start with an admission. Prayer's always been something that's been a struggle for me. It's um, kind of, I think, actually appropriate that in a week in which I'm kind of feeling pretty weak physically, that the Lord would bring us in our study of scriptures to a passage that I'm pretty weak in practically, the, the area of prayer. It's just an area in which I've known for many years that I need to continually work on and continually try to grow in. And I am grateful for the men and women that God has placed in my life who've given me good examples to try to follow. And I do such a poor job of following these examples, but I wanted to mention just a few of the people the Lord has used to kind of convict me or to help me to grow in the area of prayer. The first was my maternal grandfather, James Shepard. Now, Grandpa Shepard, as, as we call him, was a hardworking Oklahoma man He's one of these guys where you would rarely see him without dirt or grease on his hands. Um, Even when he was pastoring a rural church, he was one one time uh, was supposed to perform a wedding ceremony, and on his way to the wedding, he noticed uh, some old lady was broken down on the side of the road, so he stopped and helped her fix her car and then came a little bit late to the wedding ceremony with grease on his hands and all over his suit and all that. I mean, he's just one of these guys who is always working, always doing something with his hands. He had really rough hands, hands that were constantly working. But I remember about my grandfather being, being really impacted at an early age by his prayers because here was this rough guy, but when he would pray, he would just weep. Another thing that was unique about his prayers was he always began his prayers with the word daddy. My grandfather had grown up without much in the way of the love of of an earthly father, but he had read what the Scripture says about how our heavenly father is called in Scripture Abba, Father, right? That tender word Papa or in modern English, Daddy. And so that's how he would address the Lord. He would begin his prayers by simply saying, Daddy. And then he would often weep as he would pour out his heart to God. 
I'm reminded of Jim Wiersma. He was an elder in the church that I uh, grew up in, and he was a man of prayer, and he would lead the congregation in prayer on a regular basis and made prayer an integral part of our church services. And at the time, I, uh, when I was a teenager, you know, and you're a pastor's kid, you always get uh, uh, volunteered to do certain things. So I would often run the sound booth, and, you know, being the immature young kid that I was, I would clock Jim's prayers. And he would usually clock in at seven or seven and a half minutes. And, and I remember at the time thinking, you know, how, why does he have so much to pray for? Um, but as I got older, I realized that what I was observing was just a wonderful model and example of prayer. I want to show you a picture that a friend of mine took just uh, within the last couple of weeks. This is a, the kind of fuzzy picture of that guy in the background is a, is a picture of a guy named Dr. Daniel Wong, and he's a Bible professor out at Masters where Katie and I uh, studied. And Dr. Wong was one of Katie's professors and also was uh, one of the pastors at the Chinese church that she attended during her last year of college. Dr. Wong is an amazing person, not only because of his personal story of faith and some of the things that the Lord has brought him through, but he's also a, an amazing example of prayer for the student body because every day, without fail, he spends an hour in prayer for his students. In fact, the picture that uh, my friend snapped of him is him on his daily morning prayer walk as he walks around the campus and intercedes before God on behalf of his students. An incredible example of a man of prayer. Another uh, man who impacted me in the area of prayer was Dr. James Roscup. He was one of my professors in seminary, and his life work was to study every example of prayer in the Bible. Every time that prayer is mentioned, every time there's a prayer recorded in Scripture, or every time there's teaching about prayer, and to write a commentary about prayer going through every single mention of prayer in the Bible. And that four-volume set that you see there is his life's work as he studied the topic of prayer. He wasn't only just, a, though, a scholar on prayer. He was a man of prayer. You know, Dr. Roskup was, was kind of a, a shock for the first-year seminary students because you go into seminary and they, you start having all these classes, and the first thing that they do is in each class they give you about 1,000 pages of reading. And you have multiple classes. I mean, so you have just thousands and thousands of pages of reading. And then you're learning Greek and you're learning Hebrew, and you are so busy. I mean, I, I was working a part-time job, and you're just feeling so buried. And so it's really easy to say, hey, I'm so busy training for ministry. I don't have time for prayer. Dr. Roskup understood that danger. And so do you know what he did to us in our first year of seminary? He assigned to us an hour of prayer a day. And he didn't just assign it, he practiced it. For decades, he prayed for an hour a day, devoting himself to prayer and showing us who wanted to be ministers that we needed to be ministers of the Word and prayer. Now, Dr. Roskup was not only a professor who taught on prayer, but he was my hermeneutics professor. That's the class where they teach you Bible interpretation, how to interpret the Bible correctly. And one of the things that I loved about him is he would always say to us, observe the text. Notice what the text actually says. Just observe it. And he used to give us this assignment. We, he'd give us a verse, a short verse, and we'd have to come up with 10 observations about that text. And he would grade us on the accuracy of those observations. And so, as I was looking at this text on prayer, I was reminded of Dr. Roskup, and I decided I was just going to look at the passage as a whole and just make some observations. Now, the first thing, observation that I made is actually what's not there. I was, I was really struck by observing what isn't in Paul's apostolic model of prayer. In fact, what you, you have a hard time finding anywhere in the biblical teaching on prayer. What's not there? When we look at Paul's apostolic example of prayer, notice what we don't see. We see, for example, no mention of the physical health concerns of the one praying or those he's praying for. 
Now, certainly, we know from the book of Acts that, Paul's, that, that Paul faced physical challenges and that members of his team would get sick and face uh, uh, lots of different physical challenges. Certainly, there were people in the Ephesian church who were sick or ill, and yet there's no mention of physical health concerns at all. And throughout the pages of Scripture, it's hard to find that topic being a central topic of prayer. We see no mention of the financial concerns, either of the one praying or those he's praying for. We see no mention of anyone's kid needing to pass an exam or anyone praying for smooth and safe travels. Now, I'm not saying that it's wrong to pray for those things, but what I am saying is that when we compare the dominant themes of our prayers and the dominant themes of the prayers that are recorded in Scripture, we see a major disconnect. There's just a different set of dominant themes between biblical prayers and our prayers. Issues that to Christ and to the apostles and to the prophets were minor concerns are our major concerns. And things that to them were major concerns seem to be minor concerns to us. What we spend 80% of our time praying about, the apostles spent 20% of theirs. And what they spent 80% of their time praying about, we spend 20% of ours. So when you compare the content of prayer as recorded and taught in the Bible with a typical prayer gathering in our modern churches, you can't help but notice something. That we are exceptionally preoccupied with temporal, earthly matters. It seems that we have not really heeded the instruction of the Lord in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, when he said, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you as well. I want you to turn there to Matthew 6, and we need to be reminded of the Lord's words. Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 25. The Lord is teaching in his Sermon on the Mount about priorities. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. He says, for this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, that they do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Do not worry then, saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Now notice in verse 32 it says that your heavenly Father knows that you need these things. It's not that praying for those things are wrong. In fact, in chapter (coughs) 6, pardon me, Chapter 6, verses 7 and 8, in his introduction to the Lord's Prayer, Jesus says, don't be like the Gentiles who suppose that they're going to be heard for their many words. And he says in verse 8, do not be like them. Your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. The Lord knows what you need, and He knows that you need all of those things. So He's not saying don't pray for those things, but what He is talking about is ordering your priorities. He's saying there's something that should be first in your heart. It should be the first thing that you seek. It should be your first request. Seek first 
his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these other things will be added to you as well. You see, I think when we observe the modern church, especially in America, with our first world problems, we see that our modern prayer meetings tend to be 80% about temporary earthly things such as physical health, finances, and family events, and only 20% about eternal heavenly things such as interceding for lost souls, praying for each other's spiritual growth, or for revival. And we need to reverse that ratio, right? We have our priorities upside down. We need to reverse the ratio, not by praying less for practical matters, but by praying more for eternal, spiritual, heavenly priorities. I'm not preaching against praying for earthly needs, but I am preaching for praying for heavenly priorities. Where is the prayer in American churches for revival? Where is the intercessory prayer for unbelievers? Where is the prayer for the restoration of erring believers? When churches drift into doctrinal error, where is the earnest prayer that the Lord would bring them back? When Bible colleges and seminaries drift from their original faith and drift away into heresy, where is the prayer for the Lord to bring them to repentance? Where's the prayers for divine wisdom and insight? You see, the way that you pray reveals the priorities of your heart. You ask God for the things that are important to you. So what does your prayer life say about your priority? If the glory of God is a priority of your heart, it will fill your prayers. If the salvation of those around you is a priority of your heart, it will fill your prayers. If the church, if the body of Christ is a priority, it will fill your prayers. If holiness is a priority, your prayers will be filled with confession and repentance. If scripture is a priority, your prayers will be filled with requests for illumination, for God to open your eyes to understand the text of scripture and the ability to apply it. What do your prayers reveal about your priorities? To our shame and to my shame, Don't we have to admit that there are many days in which looking through the lens of our prayer, we see that the highest priority of our hearts is a hamburger. Our priorities are so shallow, so earthly, and so self-centered that the only thing the Lord hears from us during the day is, God, please bless this hamburger. To our shame, to my shame, sometimes we worship on Sunday saying, Lord, I want to glorify you. Lord, I want to serve you. Lord, I want to reach the world for you. And then comes Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and the only thing the Lord hears from us throughout the week is, give me this, give me that, give me this, give me that. And all of the things we're asking the Lord to give are all fleeting, temporary, fairly meaningless things. I want to address some pretty pointed and perhaps convicting comments on this topic to different groups within our church family, but I want to, before I do that, I want to make clear, I'm not responding to anything I've seen in my short time here. In fact, what I've seen in my time here has been wonderful and positive examples What I'm about to say is more based on just general observations of modern churches in our modern world and especially in first world countries. I'm not talking about any particular person or anything that I've observed. (coughs) Pardon me. But I do think there are some things that we need to think about. We need to recalibrate the purpose of our churches prayer meetings here in America. My contention, and I think that there are many who have observed this, is that most of the negative gossip that occurs in churches 
is actually done under the guise of sharing prayer requests. I want you to think about that. We use talking to God or sharing requests, prayer requests, as a cover for gossip. That's taking the Lord's name in vain. Under the guise of sharing prayer requests is where most of the grumbling and complaining that Scripture forbids occurs. We grumble about our families, we grumble about our work, we grumble about our country, we grumble about our churches, we grumble about all kinds of things, and we do it under the guise of sharing prayer requests. And so, unsurprisingly, prayer meetings are very low attended in American churches. And in fact, most prayer meetings are being done away with because just no one comes anymore, and so the church finally gives up and just closes them down. Why? Why are prayer meetings in America so notoriously lowly attended? Is it because in America we've become pridefully self-sufficient? We don't understand our need for God, and so we don't sense the need to pray? Yes, that's a huge part of it. Is it because churches have de-emphasized spiritual disciplines? Yes, that's a huge part of it. But perhaps another reason why prayer meetings are so empty is because they are so empty of prayer. And so the Holy Spirit is not compelling anyone to attend. They're just there to talk to each other, not really to talk to God. I want to ask all of our prayer group leaders and participants a hard question. And this is not because I'm reacting to something I've seen. It's because I want to make sure we never see it. Let me ask you this question. Is your prayer group really a prayer group? Is your prayer meeting really a prayer meeting? Or is it mostly chit-chat, gossip, and belly aching disguised as sharing prayer requests? If it is the latter, then low attendance at your prayer meeting is a good thing, not a bad thing. I want to also say a few things to the age groups in our church. And I want to address our beloved senior saints who are the vital and respected and beloved pillars of the church. As we age, we have more and more pressing physical concerns, real aches and pains that dominate our experience. All of those increase with age. You young people have no idea what's being talked about, but you will. I got a little taste of it the last two weeks, right? I mean, you know, you're sick and you don't bounce back quite as quick as you used to. And something that I experienced when I was sick is something that I know all of you, and especially the senior citizens, you know exactly what I'm talking about. The worse you feel physically, the harder it is to keep your mind focused on heavenly things instead of on the earthly concerns of the physical body. As pains and sicknesses and frailties increase, so does the subtle temptation for the focus of our prayers to shift along with our physical condition. Our prayers drop out of heaven and into hospitals. We begin praying more for the physical health of our own bodies than the spiritual health of the body of Christ. And imperceptibly, the focus of our prayer meetings becomes more and more about hips and cataracts and upcoming surgeries and less and less about the salvation and spiritual growth of our children and grandchildren. Breaking through barriers on the mission fields, the health of our church or revival in our city. And then we wonder why the younger generation isn't so interested in our prayer meetings anymore. Those who need prayer the most attend prayer meetings the least because those who need prayer the least dominate those meetings. And spiritual needs go unprayed for because physical needs take up all of the time. The reason I'm saying this is because I'm burdened by something. It is absolutely vital in the modern church for the younger generation to start learning from the older generation. The wisdom and the experience and the godly maturity that the Lord has given our older saints has to be passed down to the younger generation or we will be shipwrecked. 
And that's why I'm appealing to the older folks in our church, like a son appeals to a father, to diligently guard against allowing your very intense and horrific physical suffering to dominate and blind you to the spiritual needs of the young people God has placed in your life. I want you to think about going to a doctor. Our senior saints spend a lot of time at the doctor, and, but can you imagine, senior saints, if you went to a doctor for your ailments and he spent the whole time talking about his own physical problems? Would you go back to him if the doctor spent all the appointment talking about his own aches and pains? You see, that I think is one of the reasons why mentoring and discipleship isn't happening because young people sometimes go to the older folks or go to certain gatherings and they feel like they're at a doctor who's more concerned about his own aches and pains than treating them. Now, young people, or you're not going to get off the hook either. <laughs> How preoccupied are you with finances and career and your studies? If the temptation of the older generation is to allow their prayers to become dominated by health challenges, the temptation of the younger generation is to become preoccupied with financial and career challenges. And I'm not discounting those needs. The Lord did teach us to pray for our daily bread. But my question is, are you so preoccupied with financial and career matters that you're blind to the spiritual desperation of the people all around you? If finances are constantly in the forefront of your mind and prayers, what, or should I say who, is getting pushed into the background? Just as I warned the senior saints against being too preoccupied to notice your spiritual needs, I now warn the younger saints against being too preoccupied to notice the needs of our senior saints. I want this church to be a place where the aged are honored and helped by the young. There's actually a command that the young are supposed to stand in the presence of the aged. We've lost that in this society, but in this church we need to bring it back. But we also want this church to be a place where the young are encouraged and mentored and loved on by those who are a little further down the road than they are. We want this church to be a place where both groups pray for each other fervently, love each other deeply, and pray with biblical goals and priorities in mind. Again, I'm not reacting to anything negative that I've seen. In fact, I've seen some incredibly wonderful examples of this. So all I'm doing this morning is just urging you to excel even more. To excel even more in praying for one another and keeping spiritual priorities the priority. All of us, older saints and younger saints, church leaders, prayer group leaders, and pastors, all of us need to be reminded of the apostolic model of prayer and to readjust our focus and the focus of our prayers on a regular basis. Now, all of that was my observation of what's not in Paul's prayer. Not physical health, not finances, not the day-to-day -day concerns of life. Now let's look at some observations of what is in his prayer. What did Paul focus his prayer on? First, I want you to notice that Paul's prayer is fueled by the sharing of good news. The sharing of good news. Look at verse 15. He says, For this reason I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus which exists among you, and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. See, again, we notice a difference in what motivates us to pray. We're primarily motivated to pray when things go wrong. We're primarily motivated to pray by bad reports. But he was motivated to pray when he heard things were going well. Our prayer meetings are filled mostly with reports of bad news, of problems, and various crises. And I'm sure Paul heard plenty of bad reports, plenty of hard things that were happening in the Ephesian church. But it was the good news 
that really drove him to pray and to pray with thanksgiving and rejoicing. See, our problem is that we tend to talk to God only when we need something from him. But Paul's example reminds us to talk to God not only when we need something from him, but when we need to thank him for what he's already given. As I was thinking about this, I was reminded of Luke chapter 17. Do you remember in Luke chapter 17 when Jesus heals the 10 lepers? Remember they they go off to, to do the ritual cleansing in the temple and only one of them comes back to thank Jesus. Nine out of 10 just took the blessing and went their way. Only one came back to even say thank you. And too often, our prayer meetings are very analogous to the 10 lepers. They're 90% requests and only 10% thanksgiving. Maybe the Lord would answer more prayers if we gave more thanks for the ones he's already answered. Let's remember to let good reports of the many blessings that God is constantly pouring out, let them fill our prayer meetings in our hearts. (coughs) Paul was driven to prayer by the many blessings that he saw God pouring out. Second, notice that Paul's prayer is focused on three foundational Christian graces, faith, hope, and love. He says, I heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus which exists among you, and your love For all the saints. And then he says, so now I'm giving thanks for you and praying for you. And here's what I'm praying for you. He says in verse 18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling. Right? So here you have faith, hope, and love. We call this the Christian triad or the triad of Christian graces. These three things are the vital signs of the spiritual life. Faith, hope, and love, right? Physical vital signs, what are they, right? You have a strong heartbeat, good respiration, strong brain waves. Those are the vital signs of physical health. And faith in the Lord Jesus, love for all the saints, and hope in future glory are the vital signs of spiritual health. Faith is the heart of the Christian life, isn't it? It's simple, childlike trust in the Lord's goodness and power. And Paul rejoiced because the Ephesians' heartbeat was strong. They had faith in the Lord Jesus. And then their respiration was good. They were breathing well, unlike me this morning. They had love for all the saints. The breathing out and the breathing in that is the life of the church Love is like air. We breathe it out to others and draw it in ourselves. We receive love and we give love. We breathe in and we breathe out. Love is the breath of the church. And Paul rejoiced because the respiratory system was functioning well. They had love for all the saints. But he was concerned about the issue of hope. And so he prays for it. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart will be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling. Elsewhere in 1 Thessalonians, Paul described hope as being a helmet. He says, put on as a helmet the hope of salvation. Hope protects your head. It protects your thinking. Katie and I did our undergraduate studies in biblical counseling, and one of the things that our professors constantly emphasized was the vital importance of hope. Because without hope, no one will try to change. If you have a problem or you're trapped in a sin and you have no hope that God can rescue you or that you can change, you won't even try. A hopeless person is an effortless person. He won't put forth any effort, he won't even try. And so the first step to get out of whatever hole or rut you may find yourself in is to start thinking straight. And you need hope to help you start thinking straight. How can you get that hope? Paul encourages you to draw a line from what Christ did for you on the cross 
through your present problems and all the way to the fulfillment of his future promises. Draw a line from the cross through your problems and all the way to the return of Christ. To get out of the hole that you may be in this morning, you need a clear head. And to have a clear head, you're going to need hope. And to get hope, you have to remember what God has done and remember what he has promised to do. Paul's prayer, if you think about it, if you analyze it, utilizes what I call a push from behind, pull from ahead framework in which God's power in the past and God's promises for the future empower believers in the present. What God has done for us in the past pushes us, and what he will do in the future pulls us. It's the push from behind, pull from ahead framework. Let the past, what God has done for you on the cross, and what he will do for you in the future empower you to overcome the challenges of the present. If you're stuck in a rut, if you're losing hope, if you're getting desperate and you're tempted to give up, you need that Christian triad that is talked about in Paul's prayer, the things that he was praying for the Ephesians. You need faith in the Lord Jesus. You need love for all the saints, and you need the hope of his calling. Third, notice that Paul's prayer is intensely theological. This is one of the things that just observing the passage, I was just noticing it's so doctrinal, it's so theological, it has to do with eschatology, and it has to do with soteriology, and it has to do with all of these different aspects of Christian doctrine. It's intensely theological. Why? Why is his prayer so intensely theological? It's because he knows that how people think control how they speak and act. So if you're going to pray something for someone, pray for their mind to be renewed, for their mind to be transformed, for them to have the mind of Christ. The Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Right? And so Paul says in verse 18, he says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling. Right? There are things you have to know. He's praying, he's praying, Lord, they need to know these things. They need to know the hope of their calling. They need to know the riches of the glory of the inheritance that you have for them. They need to know what is the surpassing greatness of your power. Jesus taught that whatever a man thinks comes out of his mouth. Whatever fills your heart is going to come out into your life. Whatever dominates your thoughts will dominate your life. And so Paul's prayer is focused on asking the Lord to open their eyes and enable them to understand and to apply these key truths. Here at CBC, we emphasize doctrine. We emphasize doctrine and theology. Why? You know, I, I was, you know, asked, asked my kids to bring my glasses. You know, I got these really, when I had my contacts and I got these really thick glasses, you know. And, you know, do we emphasize doctrine because, you know, we want to be theology nerds with our big books and, and all of that? No, that's not, that's not why we emphasize theology at all. We emphasize theology and sound doctrine because sound doctrine is just a fancy term for godly thinking. That's what sound doctrine is, godly thinking. Thinking the way that God wants you to think. The way that corresponds to the reality of the world that he has created and the reality of who he is and the reality of who man is and who you are and what sin is and righteousness and judgment. It is godly thinking that leads to godly living. And that's why we emphasize sound doctrine here and view it as being so practical and so relevant. If you teach a man to think, you teach him how to live. And that's why Paul's prayer for the Ephesians was centered on the transformation and the renewing of their minds. 
He says, I pray that the Lord would give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, that your eyes will be enlightened, that you'll know these things, the hope and the riches and the greatness of the power And what God did when he raised Christ and what God did when he seated him at his right hand and made him high above all rule and authority and then made him the head of the church. You need to have your mind renewed. Fourth, notice that Paul's prayer was God-centered. He constantly mentions God's glory and God's power and the exaltation of Christ. In verse 17, he mentions God being the Father of glory. In verse 18, it talks about the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. In verse 19, it talks about the surpassing greatness of God's power. Verse 21 talks about the exaltation of Christ far above all rule and authority and power and dominion in every name that is named not only in this age but also in the one to come. Why do our prayers sound so much different than Paul's? It's because we start so low. We start so low. We're so often so self-centered, so man-centered and worldly in our thinking. And therefore, our prayers reflect that self-centeredness, that man-centeredness, that worldliness. But Jesus taught us in the Lord's Prayer He said, we are to pray that God's will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. But most of the time, what are our prayers focused on? Our prayers are focused on getting God to do in heaven what our will is here on earth. We have it completely backwards. Our prayers are actually often the exact opposite of the way the Lord taught us to pray. We have the wrong starting point and the wrong frame of reference. So we need to completely reorient our conception of prayer. Prayer should not be our attempt to impose our will on heaven, but rather our request that his will be done on earth. So can I ask you this? Are your prayers God-centered or self-centered? Are they filled with weighty, eternal, heavenly priorities, or are they consumed by the fleeting, passing cares of life? Do they flow from a heart that is seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness? Or do they flow from a heart that is seeking first your own comfort, your own earthly success, or whatever earthly thing is that you're preoccupied with at the moment that you pray? You know, this week, I, as I was struggling with this issue myself, I was thinking, I wonder what the angels think about our prayers. That's maybe an odd question to ask. I, I don't know, you know, what the Lord allows angels to overhear. Um, I have, you know, the Scripture doesn't say anything about that. But have you ever thought what they might say to each other if they overheard your prayers? I was thinking about that, that this week. I just kind of imagine that one angel looking at the other and saying, did Brett really come into the presence of of the most high God just to babble on and on about himself and a bunch of things that have so little eternal significance? The angels who in God's presence cover their faces, are they shocked by how often hamburgers are the primary theme of our prayers? My prayer this morning is that God-centered prayer would flow from a God-centered church with God-centered hearts. And that brings us to our fifth and last observation. Paul's prayer centered on one primary idea, the need to know God. If you look at the passage grammatically, you'll see that verse 17 is the main idea, the main prayer request. And what does he say? He says he's praying that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in what? In the knowledge of him. 
the knowledge of him. That's the main thing that he was praying for the Ephesian church about. He wanted the Ephesian church to know God. It reminds us of what he said himself in Philippians 3. He says, look, here's what I want the most. I want to know him. Turn with me to Philippians 3. Paul's prayer for the Ephesians was what he wanted for himself as well. He says, whatever was gained to me, Philippians 3, 7, these things I have counted as lost for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ, and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. If there's one thing that I would ask you to pray for me for, and if there's one thing that I would ask you to pray for your children for, pray that they will know God. We're going to spend... Just a few minutes here in prayer uh, before Ryan comes to lead us in our closing song. I want to invite you to do something. I want everyone to stand, if you would, and we're going to spend some time just in corporate prayer. There's two microphones down here at the front, and I want to just invite several of you, three or four of you, to just come down to the front, come down to the microphones, and lead us in prayer. This is our opportunity to respond in prayer to this message about prayer. So if the Lord lays on your heart, just come down to the microphone, come up front, and let's go before the Lord in prayer. And I'm gonna close us with the Lord's prayer. So come and and pray. Father, um, we do pray that we would know you more and more. Father, that we would walk with you, that we would know you, that we'd read your word, that we would come often before your throne of grace. Father, um, we wander often. We pray, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts and our lives. Father, we do pray for our children and our grandchildren and our friends around us that do not know you, that they do not walk with you. We pray, Father, that we might walk closer to you each and every day. Oh, Lord, high King of heaven, we come before your presence. We who are bought by the precious blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, we come before your holy throne. Father, we, oftentimes we have such a small view of you, Father. You are so big. Father, we are, we who are mere dust, we who are formed by dust, worship you. Father, we love you because you loved us first. Father, we cannot express by mere words how wonderful you are to us, and it is only by your grace that we are saved, for you are the author and the perfecter of our faith. Father, oftentimes when we pray, we have uh, many, many distracting thoughts that come to us as, oh, that it should not be. Father, focus our minds, focus our hearts towards you, who's the serving, who's deserves all of our attention and all of our praise and glory. And Father, glorify yourselves through our prayers. And may we pray for spiritual things. May we set our minds on heavenly things and not on things on earth. May we be your people. And may our light so shine before you. And may may your light shine through us 
that all may see that we are distinct from the world, that we are the salt. We are the salt. And Father, we pray for your kingdom to come. Father, come quickly. And may I pray that we, may you equip us every single day as we wake up in the morning, as we help us to put on the armor, your armor, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the boots of the, the shoes of the gospel, the peace, and above all, put on the shield of faith to quench the fiery darts of the evil one, of the devil, and also and to to also equip us, equip ourselves with the sword of the spirit. May your word, may we hide your heart, may, may we hide your word in our hearts that we might not sin against you. Father, we love you and and we do not know what to pray, but we know that the, the spirit intercedes from us, for us. And Father, we love you. Be with us throughout this entire day and uh, convict us of our sin. And for that, we are so grievous. Forgive us, Father. May we turn to you, our only hope of salvation. We love you so much. In your son's name, we pray, amen. Heavenly Father, Abba. We can call you Abba because you have given us the opportunity to become children of you. We are no longer orphans. You love us and you will take care of us. And we trust and have faith that you will do so. But around us, we see others that are spiritually orphans. Heavenly Father, thank you for, and we praise you for all the gifts that you have given us. The ability to be able to call you Abba, the ability to, to, to live and work, and to be able to share what we have with others. In particular, that great word that you have given us. Heavenly Father, we, we pray that you strengthen us. Give us your Holy Spirit's confidence and ability to know the right words to say at the right time, to identify these orphans. Thank you that you give us the privilege and honor that you present to us opportunities to share the gospel with these people, not just here at home, but also overseas. There are many children and people in need, in darkness. They don't have much. But if they have your love, your faith, your mercy, and know your grace, oh, how happy they are. Bring us the joy in our hearts that we can share your gospel with others. Let us share the gifts that you have given to us. We praise your name that in all that we do, we bring glory to you. In Jesus' name. Join me in praying the Lord's Prayer together. It's on the screen. Our Father, Father, 